Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. What is the socialist approach to ending violence against women and defending the right to protest? This episode is a recording of the introduction at a national online meeting hosted by the Socialist Party and attended by around 150 people. We have not included the discussion as people attending had the right to use the meeting to work out their ideas. Sarah Sachs Eldridge, the Socialist Party national organiser, gave the introduction. If you would like to discuss any of these ideas, read the Socialist Party's fighting programme for women's rights and socialism that the Socialist Party's National Women's Bureau has produced in conjunction with the party leadership, Get In Touch. Contact details are in the episode notes. This bonus episode of Socialism looks at ending women's oppression. placard on a recent protest in Cardiff said there is no end to protest until there is an end to oppression and I think that the events of the last week have made it so clear that ending violence against women and the right to protest are linked and both are not safe in Tory hands. The murder of Sarah Everard has opened up a huge well of anger. A recent stat says it all. 97% of young women have experienced sexual harassment. That's a pandemic. How could there not be anger? But we think there's more to the anger than that. Violence against women is not new, sadly. So why now? Because the pre-existing gender inequality in society, women, particularly working class women, have been especially hit by the economic and social consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our jobs, pay, our hours and working conditions have all come under attack and the gender pay gap was already a huge thing just highlighted by COVID, like so many of the inequalities and injustices that exist in society. Because of women's historic discrimination, and because we still have the main responsibility for childcare, we tend to be concentrated in low-paid, part-time and often precarious jobs. Zero-hour contracts make women workers more vulnerable to abusive bosses. Sectors such as hospitality and retail were severely affected by the lockdown. And there's more to the picture than that. Capitalism is a system in crisis and the capitalist class, the billionaire bosses, they want us to pay for that crisis through cuts to our jobs and our services. But we want to make them pay. We want them to pay for the crisis they caused. Public sector cuts have exacerbated the undermining of our safety. Cuts to street lighting, cuts to bus routes, sacking the guards on the trains, as well as the cuts to all the services that we need. The criminal underfunding and under-resourcing of support for victims of rape and domestic violence, incidences of which have increased under lockdown, has been exposed. To fight for women's safety, we've got to fight all the cuts. That's why socialists organise in communities, workplaces and trade unions. We use every tool at our disposal to fight these dangerous cuts. The Socialist Party will be part of the over 300 No Cuts candidates standing under the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition banner on the 6th of May. What could they do? Listen to this. Over a six-month period in 2018, a 1,000 women and children were turned away from refuges due to lack of funding. But councils had a choice. At that period, the 125 labour control councils held around £14 billion sat in usable reserves while they were cutting those services. They could have refused the Tories' bidding and instead helped build a mass campaign for the funding that we need for all our services. Tusk candidates are pledged to vote against all cuts and build a fight for the money our communities need for transport, for street lighting and also pledge to fight discrimination. Before I move off the question of why now, there's one other factor which has made this particular story the trigger to these protests and not, for example, the horrendous way that the police dealt with the sisters Nicole and Bibba Henry who were stabbed to death in Wembley. It was revealed that police officers took selfies with their bodies. The factor is the billionaire-owned media. It promotes sexism but also racism, pumping poisonous ideas into society. And our response must be that we unite and fight to end violence against all women and all forms of discrimination. The movement has already given a glimpse, a tiny glimpse, of what is possible and necessary. The government has conceded around 22 million of safe streets funding for street lighting and CCTV, but this barely scratches the surface of what's needed but does show that when pressure is applied, money can be found that they claimed didn't exist. 
So let's build a mass movement that can force more retreats from this weak and divided government. Let's build on the 20 or so U-turns they've already made, including the one inflicted by the students on them over the A-levels algorithms. But ending violence against women is about more than fighting for the resources that we need, essential though that is. It's estimated that around 85,000 women a year are raped, almost 10 an hour every day of the year in Britain. Those kind of levels of harassment, of violence and abuse are systemic. They are the consequence of inequality at the heart of capitalism, based as it is on the exploitation of the majority by a tiny handful of big business bosses. Capitalism is a system which perpetuates sexism and abuse. We live in a system where a small minority owns the wealth, where exploiting women in low-paid, precarious jobs generates enormous profits and the unpaid work that women do in the home saves capitalism billions of pounds every year. The private companies which dominate and control the media, but also the beauty, the fashion, the leisure and other industries, reflect and promote sexist ideas about how women should look, about how we should behave and turn our bodies into commodities to make a profit. It's probably been noted by everybody listening that every news article about Sarah Everard seems to come up with ads that are actually using women's bodies to sell commodities for profit. To eliminate gender violence and abuse, we need fundamental system change that takes economic and political control out of the hands of the minority that profit from gender and class inequality. And that means a mass united struggle of all those who face discrimination, inequality and exploitation in the workplace and in wider society. Society. That means a mass united working class struggle and that is why the Socialist Party is fighting for a socialist world and we hope that you will join us in that. However, as well as the tiny bit of spending the government has implemented, it has also announced something a lot more sinister. The idea of plain clothes police in nightclubs. Student safety campaigners have explained that there are definitely measures that could be taken to increase safety, lids for drinks and so on, not police spies in our social spaces. There's currently an inquiry into the Spice Cops scandal of secret police who are mainly spying on and trying to undermine left and trade union campaigns. Those spy cops also formed relationships with women while undercover and we campaign to end this attack on democratic rights and this attack on women. It is not only extreme examples, though, like this, that have undermined women's trust in the police, or even their behaviour in Clapham at the vigil, or even that Wayne Cousins' previous behaviour was not taken seriously. There were, for example, 666 reports over three years of domestic abuse incidences and offences perpetrated by police themselves. Negligence and prejudice by police and judges also deny women justice and condemn them to further abuse. Fewer than 20% of the women who are raped even report what happened to the police. And that's not surprising, is it, when you think only 1.5% of reported rapes end in conviction. Police failings include refusal to investigate, inadequate and indifferent investigations when they do, and victim-blaming approaches. So what do we do about this? Well, Cressida Dick at the top of the Met Police makes it painfully clear that it's not enough to have a woman commissioner at the top just to defend women's rights. It depends whose interest that woman stands for, what class interests. For example, she was one of the people in charge overseeing Blair's anti-democratic, anti-terror legislation and she, like Pretty Patel, seeks to represent the interests of the capitalist class. When it comes to Patel, how can we trust a woman who declares her concern for women's safety when we know that she considered putting a wave machine in the channel to deter desperate people fleeing war, abuse and poverty? And it's since been exposed how Patel's claimed concern at the policing was also a lie. She had actually endorsed it, it appears. At Clapham Common, people chanted at the police, who do you serve? Who do you protect? And that gets to the core of the matter. The primary role of the police is ultimately not to serve and protect the people, but to serve and protect the existing order, i.e. the exploitation and the inequality of the capitalist system itself. The same goes in the final analysis for the court system, which does not deliver justice for women and all the institutions of the state. Ultimately, the class oppression at the heart of class societies is inherently untenable. That exploitation of the overwhelming majority by this tiny handful of billionaire big business bosses, it's untenable and it's from maintaining that that the need for forces like the police arise. 
Challenging the sexist ideas that are prevalent within the police includes fighting for democratic control of the police by local community and trade union organisations. And that means fighting to take the decisions and the control out of the hands of those defenders of capitalism. The pandemic and the austerity measures prove that we can't trust them with our lives or our livelihoods. And ultimately, fighting to change the system for a socialist transformation of society. The ban and the policing on the vigils for Sarah Everard was an attack on the democratic rights to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And under the new measures proposed in the Tory Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, protesters could face a fine of £2,500 if a protest is considered a public nuisance, i.e. by being an effective protest. The Home Secretary would even have the power to determine whether we even have the right to protest. Democratic rights to protest, to assemble, to organise are not permanent, that's been shown, and they must be defended at all times. This ban on the vigil was an attempt by the courts and the police to silence us and contain the anger that has been triggered by Sarah's death. It's no coincidence that this bill is going through Parliament, just as workers and young people are organising to fight the derisory NHS pay offer, the disgusting fire and rehire practices rolling out across workplaces and as students are fighting for fee and rent refunds after the year they've had in universities. It is exactly because resistance to the working class paying for the Covid crisis measures instead of the bill billionaires was anticipated by the capitalist class that the Tories are pushing this bill. And until the policing of the vigil for Sarah Everard turned a spotlight on the bill, Keir Starmer's new Labour planned to abstain on it. How can you even consider abstaining on something that seeks to silence the working class when we need to be defending ourselves against the boss's onslaught? When your central aim is to prove that you're a better Tory than the Tories, i.e. defender of the billionaires, that's when you do it. So our democratic rights must be defended, the right to protest, to organise, to march and to strike, and that requires mass organisation and mass action to fight the bill. Well, it being brought into law won't be an absolute obstacle to protest and especially to collective working class action. If passed, it aims to undermine that, obviously in big businesses' interests. Last week, for example, a nurse was arrested and fined £10,000 on an action taken against the government's insulting 1% pay rise. Picketing workers in Scotland were stopped by the police this week. In Leeds last November, bus manufacturing workers faced threats from the police to fine strikers if they continued to picket, citing the new Covid restrictions. But the government conceded that the right to picket should remain on the eve of Unite taking the Health Secretary and North Yorkshire Police to court. And it's significant that Unite the Union was the first to issue a statement condemning the policing of the vigil. 72% of its 1.4 million members are men. And this points to the role that the 6 million strong trade union movement could play in both ending violence against women and defending the right to protest but we need the trade union leaders to lead it's time to get coordinating our protests starting with the nhs workers linking up with those facing attacks across the public sector with students with young workers looking down the barrel of unemployment Over the last week, we've had brilliant action, but we've also seen the likes of Jess Phillips, right-wing Labour MP, getting a lot of airtime, and this is massive hypocrisy on her part. Let's not forget, Phillips was one of the 184 Labour MPs who abstained on the Tory bill, which delivered 12 billion of benefit cuts, mainly falling on women. She did not vote against a bill which protects current and future spy cops from prosecution if they commit crimes while undercover. She offers no way forward and her ideas offer no way forward for our movement other than blaming men. Phillips is a pro-capitalist politician whose opposition will never mean building the mass action for the socialist policies that are needed to fight inequality. So what do we really need to do to end inequality? It starts with looking at where it comes from. Capitalism is based fundamentally on the exploitation of one class, the working class, who also form the majority, by another, the capitalist class. The ruling capitalist class hold nearly all the power in society. Their ideas dominate, including divisive ideas like racism and sexism, which actually help maintain their power because they divide the working class and keep us looking to blame each other and not them. But because of our role in production and the consciousness of our collective interests that that can generate, the working class has the potential power to replace capitalism with a socialist alternative based on democratic planning to meet the needs of all. The working class, organised and fighting back, remains the agent of the socialist change we need. Look at how transport workers, by going on strike in London, can cost the city millions in just one day. There is enormous potential power there. 
So how do we challenge the culture promoted, including by the media, big business, etc., that says women are second class, inferior, available and so on? We don't just say, let's fight for socialism. The first thing is to organise to challenge those ideas. So we call for campaigns for zero tolerance of sexism in the workplaces and in education. But who's best placed to carry out such campaigns? Not the bosses or the university vice-chancellors who've put their profits and the collecting of student fees over our safety this last year. Who can we trust with our safety? It was bus workers who had to defy threats from the bus company bosses in London and take action for the safety of drivers and passengers. It was members of the NEU Education Union who mobilised across the country against the rushed and unsafe reopening of schools after Christmas when the virus was rising. Trade unions, where they are organised, democratic and active in defence of their members, have shown also how sexism in the workplace can be fought and also racism. In 2017, a predominantly male workplace, actually, at Woolwich Ferries, was willing to strike in order to stand shoulder to shoulder with a woman union member who faced sexual harassment from the bosses. The Unite branch built a campaign which posed the question of who controls the workplace. The action led to the removal of the most senior manager and the workers demanded that management positions should be filled by an election of the workforce. That gives an idea of how we could, you know, organise society on a bigger scale, doesn't it? And the protests so far give a glimpse not only of the concessions that a mass movement could win, but of the ways that ideas, including the deeply held attitudes to women, could be challenged too. By struggling together, many backward attitudes can be overcome faster than a lifetime of education and training, important though that is. That's one of the lessons of the 1980s miners' strike. Women literally moved from the kitchen to the picket line. Initially, some men were suspicious, but when they saw women fighting the coal bosses and their common enemy in the Tories, they recognised the benefit of uniting, and to do that, their ideas were challenged. I'm not saying all those men reacted well. You never have a change that takes place in one fell swoop. But nonetheless, these events played a significant role in changing attitudes to women, as did women's mass move into the workplace after World War II. The struggle for socialism, which basically means taking the wealth, power and control in society out of the hands of the tiny group of billionaire big business bosses who currently control it, like for example the three firms who control 80% of print media in Britain, and instead starting to democratically plan the economy in the interest of the overwhelming majority, that's what socialism means, that struggle will do more than give us the chance to fight alongside each other and develop trust that overcomes suspicion of different groups. It will do more than fight for improvements in our lives, although we welcome every step forward we can gain. Fighting to transform society along socialist lines, that's what's really needed to end the inequality and the exploitation at the heart of society from which all the inequality flows and infects us. Thank you very much. If you like what you've heard, recommend us to your co-workers and friends, donate to help fund us, and if you agree, join the Socialists. Socialism was produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for Workers International. Today we heard from Sarah Sachs Eldridge and I'm Helen Patterson. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. You can find further reading in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? Now is the time to get in touch and find out more about joining. Apply to join at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism the podcast has no wealthy backers. We rely on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to the capitalists. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity. Solidarity.